<clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and get started. As usual, this class is being recorded. <clears throat> Today, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is uh, Monday, March 11, 2 p.m. section. Got a lot to cover today, <clears throat> but uh, what's going to be important is today we're going to start the third section of the class, which is the valuation modeling. You're going to need a file in the files folder. <clears throat> it is under NVIDIA, and it's called valuation model NVIDIA start.xlsx. So make sure you grab that file, download it, have it open in Excel, ready to go in a few minutes. <clears throat> but a few things. Um, unfortunately, I got a medical thing I have to do on Wednesday. So I don't know if you'll consider this good or bad news, but we're not gonna have class on Wednesday. What that practically means <clears throat> is that the group case presentations are gonna be moved to two weeks from today, which is the Monday <clears throat> you get back from spring break. Okay. Now, I've also added to that presentation and I made the change this morning so in addition to NVIDIA you're also going to do an ROIC tree <clears throat> and CFI on Intel okay so you got to do both in 10 minutes and comparison between the two companies a little bit of benchmarking okay so your new group case which is being pushed for two weeks from today is going to also include Intel as well as NVIDIA so you got four statements to go through in 10 minutes and compare the two companies. So you're going to have to be on your game to get all of this done. <clears throat> so rather than having it done on Wednesday, you could use Wednesday's class time to work on that presentation, but we're going to be presenting the Monday we come back from spring break. <clears throat> okay. Now, last week, you should have done your Nike assignment, which, again, hopefully no major issues with that, but very quickly, when you did your individual Nike, starting with the ROIC trait, you would have talked about how Nike's end of year ROIC went from 40% to 31.6. And part of the reason it went down is because the tax rate went from 16.1 to 18.2, which is one of the reasons why the ROIC went down. But it wasn't the only reason because the pre-tax ROIC went from 47.8 to 38.7. That was driven down by the operating margin falling from 12.2 to 11.5. And the invested capital sales worsening from 25.5 to 29.8. Both of those hurt the pre-tax ROIC. What was primarily driving the operating margin down was the gross margin, falling from 46.5 to 44.9. <clears throat> uh, SG&A's percentage of sales stayed pretty flat at 32.5 to 32, <clears throat> uh, although it should have helped them a little bit. And depreciation went from 1.8 to 1.4, which again should have helped a little bit. So really, the operating margin was primarily all the gross margin falling. In terms of the worsening productivity, operating working capital went from 12 to 13. That hurt the IC to sales. PP need of sales went from 12.1 to 15.6. That was the big driver down of the invested capital sales worsening. And intangible to sales stayed flat at 1.1 to 1.1. So summarizing, it was the worsening of the PP need of sales from 12 to 16, as well as an investment in working capital from 12 to 13, which drove the invested capital sales from 25.5 to 29.8, corresponding with a drop in gross margin, which had the operating margin go from 12 to 11. <clears throat> led to the pre-tax ROIC falling from 47.8 to 38.7, with slightly higher taxes for 16.8 to 18.2, pushing down the after-tax ROIC from 40 to 31.6. All right. I went through that much quicker. Number one, you should have more familiarity. But number two, I wanted to show you I can get it done in about two and a half minutes. Okay. And I'm just saying, you're going to have to be closer to that level of cadence to do that Intel on both NVIDIA Intel as well as the CFIs. Okay, and the comparisons. Again, you got 10 minutes. All right. Now, in terms of Nike's CFI, again, you would have started with a total of 18 billion 139 of free cash flow, 27.2 billion of gross cash flow, uh, peaking in 2022 at 6.8 billion, falling in 2023 to 5.5 billion, but 27.2 billion over the five years. They reinvested 8.9 billion of reinvestment. I think forgot to copy over the reinvestment rate. You could have done that math uh, on a calculator, but basically giving them free cash flow uh, before goodwill of about 18.3 billion. They didn't really do much in the way of acquisitions. 116 million of investment in goodwill, so about 18.3 in pre-tax or sorry pre-goodwill free cash flow 
and about 18.1 in after goodwill free cash flow. Uh, they also spent 141% CapEx depreciation in 2023, which suggested 2024 they expect to be a growth year. Right? <clears throat> 18.1 billion of free cash flow turned into 11.9 billion of CFI, primarily because they increased their excess cash by about 5 billion and they increased their non operating assets and liabilities 1.9 billion. So, what did they do with the 11.9 billion of CFI? They paid a billion in interest. They borrowed $8.3 billion of new debt, mostly in 2020, when the debt went up by $9.5 billion. They paid $8.3 billion in dividends over the five years, bought back $17.5 billion of share repurchase. So again, similar to other companies, Nike also used debt to buy back its stock. We can clearly see that in here. Okay. So questions about your homework seven? Hopefully pretty easy. All right. Those were some of the highlights. Um, again, went through that relatively quickly just because you want to kind of get through these and then start doing the comparisons with Intel. Who's doing better or worse and why? Yes, sir. Is that, like the example you just gave, the level of debt is more than Minimum. Yeah. 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 Just because I, I expect a little less on the intermediate years only because I'm adding another company. Okay. Now, if you can do that in the intermediate years in all 10 minutes and get it all done, A+. Plus. But but I, I'm just recognizing that because I threw Intel in there as a benchmark, you're going to have to go through a faster cadence. But make sure, use the numbers, don't start getting general. Make sure that you connect, whether it's helping or hurting, the, the items above that are leading to the ROIC changes. Don't just purely read numbers when you get through this. Okay? And this is on video. If you want to go back and look at this as an example. Yes, sir. If a big number changes for NVIDIA, like they did a giant acquisition, you should say something. I don't think they did, but but you could. Just as an example, and I don't know about Intel. I just put up the data this morning for Intel. All right. <clears throat> but I will tell you, Intel's not doing so well. And I think that's the interesting compare and contrast to the semiconductor industry. All right, so back to this. That's your change on Wednesday. The other thing that happens on Wednesday is the first half of the Bloomberg Trading Challenge ends. So just taking a look at your section, this is section 301. You're going to be scored on portfolio value, right? So very important. I'm going to take screenshots at about 5 p.m. on Wednesday. That's where the first half ends. This is going to be essentially the same type of ranking on portfolio value. Uh, <clears throat> make sure that you do not liquidate. Don't go below or above 300000 in cash. That'll disqualify your team. So treat it as if you're going to continue investing on Thursday. Okay? And then everybody's hit the minimum 10 longs. That's really great. So if the trading competition were to end today, uh, was it Villa Mayor? Is that pronounced right? I don't know who you bought, but you are by far way ahead. And I don't think it's going to change in the next two days. Miracles can happen because the CPI is coming out tomorrow. But regardless, they did something right. So maybe when we get back for spring break, maybe they'll give us some insights. Maybe they won't because there's a second half of the competition. But uh, they're in first place. So if the competition were to end and they're still in first place, they'd get five points. Uh, Wolf and Nozika would get four each. Resnick, three. Wang, two. Marks, one. That would be the, the rankings as of today. Now, obviously, there's some changes there between the second place and the third place team, or sorry, third and fourth place team. That could actually swap. They're pretty close. Um, but regardless, a couple more days. We'll see what happens. Questions about the trading challenge? On Thursday, <clears throat> what I will do is I will basically clone this network. I'll wipe out all your trades. You'll start with a million dollars. It'll be called 2H for second half. I'll keep the first half in there uh, so you can see what you originally bought. But you'll say 2H, and then you basically trade again for six more weeks. So that way, if you're in last place, all hope is not lost. And if you're in first place, you don't get an automatic advantage. Everybody starts the same place, clean slate, starting Thursday. By the Wednesday, you get back from spring break. That's when you have to be fully invested. But if you want to start later this week, you're welcome to do so. All right, questions about the trading competition? Okay, great. <clears throat> and... Last but not least, midterm exam. So last Wednesday, you took a midterm exam. 
and 10 question midterm. So let's just talk about the answers to those questions. Should have already seen your scores. <clears throat> All right. So question one. If the CFI and TII don't balance, you're mu likely missing an item from the income statement because the income statement drives the TII. So therefore, if that's not balancing, it's because of the income statement problems. Question number two, which of the following is not part of the key value driver formula? Invested capital. You could have literally looked at the formula in the PowerPoint slide. It's not in there. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, in the book? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure. Show me the formula and I'll consider it. But I think they were doing that for the economic profit formula. I don't think they were doing it for the key value driver formula. Okay. So the one that's actually based, that they call key value drivers, I don't think they do it that way. But I could be wrong, but that's what I remember for the book. Okay. Uh, question three. Which of the following is not part of operating working capital? That would be your current portion of the long-term debt. That's a three. That's going to be part of the debt. Okay. Question four, which of the following would be a reason to decrease the payout rate? If you're decreasing the payout rate, by definition, you're increasing the reinvestment rate. Payout plus investment equal 100%. The only reason to increase the investment rate is if you have a positive spread. Therefore, ROIC greater than WAC. Okay. You can have a positive free cash flow and a negative spread. Right. So therefore, you need to have a positive spread to want to reinvest. Question five, uh, which of the two companies below would trade at a higher multiple? The answer is they're going to trade the same multiple. Income, profit does not affect the multiple. Okay, We talked about that in key value drivers. So since the three drivers, growth, return, and risk are the same, they would trade at the same multiples. So again, you could play that out in the key value driver formula to verify that. Which of the following would increase your CFI? Okay. Well, if you increase your <coughs> excess cash, you're reducing your cash. If you decrease your accounts payable, you're basically paying a vendor, which is decreasing your CFI. If you increase your inventory, you're spending cash to buy inventory, you're decreasing your CFI. If you decrease your other liabilities, same thing, you're paying off somebody, it decreases your CFI. So the answer by elimination is none of the above. Which of the following impact free cash flow, or would the impact of free cash flow on the purchase of PP&E? Uh, basically, free cash flow would go down because PP&E would increase gross investment, which would reduce your free cash flow. <clears throat> which of the following would lead to an increase in EV to EBIT multiple? Higher WAC hurts your multiple. Uh, higher EBIT doesn't affect the multiple. <clears throat> Lower tax rate gives you a higher no plat and therefore a higher ROIC. That would actually increase your multiple. So lower tax rate. Question nine. If you did an EIC analysis uh, and expected the future spread to be higher, which of the following is likely true? Well, if the buyer power is higher, you're probably not going to have a higher spread. If the substitutes are higher, not going to have a higher spread. If the barriers to entry are lower, you're going to see more competitors cop come in. It's going to be harder to have a higher spread. But if the power supplier is lower, that might actually help you get a better spread. So the answer would have been power supplier is lower. And then finally, performing an ROIC tree analysis, which of the following would lead to an increase in ROIC over the five years. Uh, if you do any of those three things, increase your invested capital, increase the tax rate, or decrease the margin, all of those hurt your ROIC. So the answer is none of the answers listed. Those were the 10 questions on the midterm. Okay, you should have seen your score. You need six out of 10 points to opt out of the final exam. If you are below 6 out of 10, I apologize, but you're going to have to take the final exam, and there's no changing that. Okay. Again, questions about the midterm. For those of you taking the final, it's going to look a lot like this, just FYI. But that's a month and a half away. All right, <clears throat> two months away at this point. All right, so as I said, what we're going to spend the rest of our class time on is your next graded homework assignment, homework eight, which is starting the third section of the class, which is valuation, okay? 
And what we're going to do, the file that I told you to download, use Excel here, which is valuation model NVIDIA start. So what we're going to do is we're going to build together a reusable valuation model tied to Bloomberg and NVIDIA is the company we're going to all value together. Okay, And so basically it's going to take us the next three weeks to build out this valuation model in class. Okay, Once we do that, it will take you 10 minutes to do this at another company. Okay, And this model that you're building, you will need to do the next homework assignments for the second half of the semester. Right? I am not going to give you this file. The one we're building in class that I'm building, I'm not going to give you. Right? And the reason why is because if I gave you the solution, it's a black box. You wouldn't know why things work the way they do. So the only way you know how a complex model works is if you build it yourself. Now, I didn't want to start with a completely blank Excel model because it would just take too long. Okay? So what I've done is I've kind of given you the starting point for a model, and then we're going to build the model from this starting point together so you kind of see how it works. But you have to build it individually. No sharing models. Sharing models in XF. Okay? You don't want that right, in the Honor Council. So basically, you have to build it yourself, and you will need to build it to do all future homework assignments. So today, we're going to start building it. Where we end class at the end of today is homework eight. Okay? So in just a minute, when I start doing things, you're going to do exactly what I do in your Excel model. And if you finish exactly where I end up at the end of class today, you can literally submit your homework eight today. Most people in the previous sections already did. Easy two points. Okay? And then we're going to pick up from that exact point in two weeks, actually the Wednesday after spring break, and we'll then continue building the model from there. So, a couple words about the model. This model, which has a series of worksheets that work from left to right, is tied to Bloomberg. The first tab is called Model Data. That is an export from Bloomberg of raw income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow data. Okay? <clears throat> and six years of historical data. Right? And the reason why I'm exporting historical data is it turns out Bloomberg doesn't have standardized income statements and balance sheets across companies. They just don't. So we need to have a reasonable model to have standardized financial statements. So what we're going to do is, in this model, we build our own standardized income statements and balance sheets. So we take the raw data from Bloomberg, and there's another worksheet over here called Income. This is the standardized income statement. And there's another tab called Balance Sheet. This is the standardized balance sheet. So six years of financials give you six years of financial income statements and balance sheets. Now, you would have appreciated this on previous homework assignments because they're standardized. I then give you a TFI that balances for the six years that are tied to those statements and a TII that balances for those six years tied to those standardized income statements, which then gives us six years of historical CFI, which balance, and six years of historical economic profit. Okay, those are kind of the worksheets. Right? And oh, by the way, the final tab is the ROIC tree, which is auto-built by this model. Okay? So that's your NVIDIA ROIC tree for the group project that you're doing. Okay? So over here, those are the models. That's kind of where we're starting. Okay? Two additional tabs, assumptions and ratios, which represent best practice. Okay? So the first best practice is when we build a valuation model, we're going to make assumptions about the future. Okay? We want to put those assumptions in our model in as few places as possible. Like, we don't want to scatter changeable assumptions across all the worksheets. If you do, when you reuse the model, I guarantee you're going to forget that you left some variable for NVIDIA that you forgot to change when you go do Home Depot. And you're like, oh, I can't understand why my Home Depot model doesn't make any sense because you left an assumption carried over. To mitigate against that possibility, all of the assumptions that are changeable across valuations will be in two tabs, assumptions and ratios. Okay? The differentiation between those two tabs is assumptions are just that. They're universal assumptions across all the years. They never change. The ratios are assumptions that change year by year. Okay? So year by year, things that can change, ratios, 
Things that don't usually change across the years, assumptions. That's kind of how differentiating between those two tabs. But you'll also notice the color yellow. Okay? I have chosen the color yellow arbitrarily. If you like a different color, pick another color. But the point is, that tells us that that is something that we can change in a model. If it's not in yellow, we might break something. Because I don't want to break a formula, and I don't want to break a relative reference. Otherwise, my TIIs won't flow from the income statement correctly, for example. So, so I can differentiate what I can change, what I can't change. I highlighted things in yellow as things that I can change once we built the model. That's why it's yellow. Okay? And <clears throat> we'll continue adding to that, but that just kind of gets us started. Okay? The ratios also represent another best practice. And the idea is that when you forecast financial statements, the better practice is to forecast ratios, not forecast statements directly. So by forecasting the ratios, we will create the statements, as opposed to forecasting statements to create ratios. We kind of go the reverse. So the reason why there's six historical years, or five historical years of ratios, five here, is that, um, based on six years of statements, is that we're using baselines of ratios to help us with the forecast, okay? But those will change to be more realistic as we do NVIDIA or another company, okay? So that's kind of the status of the model that I gave you. So now, unless there's any questions, we're gonna start the build and you're gonna start following exactly what I do. You're now about to do what I do, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna start in the ratios tab, is we're gonna start forecasting the future. The first year for NVIDIA will be 2025 because I know in H in the assumptions, the last reported year where they just reported their earnings is for fiscal 24 in January, so they're in fiscal 25. That's also why we use relative data, okay? What I mean by that is on the ratios tab, we're gonna go to H2 equals G2 plus one, previous year plus one. Again, I don't wanna hard code a year because if the years ever change, I want the model to everything flow through. Okay? Now, because this is gonna be a forecast, starting in H1, I'm gonna add the word forecast. Okay? Just to differentiate what's historical and what's forecast. A lot of data on these tabs. The first forecast number we're gonna do is revenue growth rate. All of these ratios are percentage of sales with the exception of revenue growth rate, which is a percentage change, okay? Now, for revenue growth rate for 2025, as a placeholder, we're just gonna assume the past repeats itself. So for H3 equals G3, and that's a cell that we're gonna make yellow, okay? <clears throat> now, just to preview what we're about to do, I'm gonna go to the income tab, the standardized income statement. Again, H1 forecast, H2 of the income tab equals G2 plus one, previous year plus one. For 2025 revenue forecast for NVIDIA equals 2024 revenue, so G3, times left parentheses, one plus the expected revenue growth rate, so ratios H3, right print. So if they grow another 125 point whatever percent, revenue would go to 135, 595.09. Okay, now just to match the formatting, I'm gonna select from H3 all the way down here to H27 format, comma, one decimal place, all right? <clears throat> and just so that you can see what I am doing, I don't want you to do this, I'm gonna hide columns B through E, and I'm gonna hide them. And the reason I'm hiding them is I'm gonna make this bigger, so it's just easier to see. If I made it bigger, you'll be able to see everything. I want you to see column A and column H. You shouldn't have to do that. But if you do hide, don't delete. You'll screw up the model, okay? So here's the point. If 
they grow at 125.9%, it'll go to 137, 595.1 of revenue, right? Don't do what I'm about to do. If next year they grow at 43.2%, revenue goes to, oh, because I have a comma in there, 43.2, revenue would be 87,240. We change the ratio, we change the numbers. After spring break, we're going to put in more realistic ratios. For now, we're just going to leave equal the previous year, 125.9. And so therefore, the number here for you should be 137,595.1. Everyone with me? All right. You're going to notice a similar process. What we're going to do is the next number we're going to forecast is EBITDA. Okay? 2025 EBITDA equals, so H8 on the income tab from the ratios is, oh, sorry, skip a step, ratios. Ratios, H7 is EBITDA equals G7, yellow. So we're going to directly forecast EBITDA, right? And I'm doing this for simplicity, right? Now, if this were a real world analysis, we would also forecast cost of revenue and operating expenses, SGNA. All right? But the model doesn't care. And for simplicity, we're going to directly forecast SGNA. So those two numbers should sync to your EBITDA, okay? but it just makes the model more complex. So for simplicity, we're going to directly forecast EBITDA. It's a critical number to approximate gross cash flow. Okay? We're also going to forecast depreciation. So for H8 equals G8, we're going to make that yellow which means we're going to solve for operating income. Operating income equals EBITDA, H7, minus depreciation, H8, 54.1%. That is not going to be yellow because we're solving for it. All right, we forecast EBITDA and depreciation. We solve for EBIT or operating income. Now, I could have chosen to forecast EBIT directly and backed into an EBITDA, but I've just chosen this method of forecasting EBITDA first. Okay, solve for EBIT. Questions? We need a tax rate for 2025. As a placeholder, 2025 tax rate, H10 equals G10, yellow. No plat, we solve. There's a formula. You can see it in G11 if you edit it. That is your operating income times one minus the tax rate, right? Since I'm going to be lazy, I'm going to take... G11, I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go to H11, and I'm going to paste it. So 47.6% no plat. And the final income statement ratio is non-operating gains and losses equals the previous year. So H12 equals G12. And again, that's something we can change. So I'm going to make that one yellow. So those are the five critical income statement ratios that we are going to forecast. Yes. Those are the five critical ratios we're going to forecast. So no plat. There's a formula in G11. Just copy the formula in G11 over to H11. It's the easiest way. But it's bait, or if you want to do it, it's operating income times left per n one minus the tax rate right per n. Yes. Why are we having H10? Because. He asked about the formula in G11. So why are we highlighting it? Well, I'm not highlighting it. Yeah, why are we not highlighting it? Oh, because that's a result of this times 1 minus that. Okay. So we solve for that. So some we solve for, mm -hmm. some we assume. Okay? But good questions. No questions and dumb questions. We're going through this. Yes? Should you change it to what? Uh, H because it would be different. Well, when you copy it from G11 to H11, it'll change every G to every H. So that's the whole point. Excel will adjust the relative references. All right. <clears throat> so looking ahead, take column H. Copy it. 
select over to column M, paste. We're going to assume the 2024 ratios repeat themselves for the next six years. Now, this is just a placeholder. I know they're not going to keep growing at 126% a year. We'll put in more realistic data later. But for now, just 2024 repeats itself. Okay? That's where we're going to start. So we all get the same data. Now we're going to go build the income statement. I was getting ahead of myself. So go back to the income tab. Starting with EBITDA in dollars, 2025. So H8 equals, and by the way, you might want to save this as you go along, because it would be a tragedy if your computer froze up or crashed <laughs> as you built this. All right, EBITDA 2025 equals ratios H7 which is 2025 EBITDA as a percentage of sales, times income, H3, which is 2025 revenue. Now, I don't know why my tab name just renamed itself. What the heck I did? So I'm going to call that income again. So again, should be ratios H7 times income H3. Okay. So if we hit that ratio and we hit that dollar target for revenue, that's our EBITDA in dollars. Same thing for depreciation. Equals ratios 2025 EBITDA as a percentage of sales. So that's H8 times income 2025 revenue H3, 3405.9. Operating income, we're going to solve, equals EBITDA, H8, minus depreciation, H9, 74468.8 of operating income. So very quickly, we have a forecast for our operating income or EBIT for NVIDIA next year. Okay. Next, assumption. We use a constant whack in our valuations. And the reason we do that is it assumes you're using a target capital structure. For simplicity, we're going to assume the current capital structure equals the target capital structure, which means we're going to leave the debt equity ratio alone. Okay? So since we're not going to muck with the balance sheet, and you'll quickly find out it has zero impact on the valuation, if we maintain the debt, we've got to maintain the interest payments. So for interest expense, oh my god, I spilled a drink on my computer. I hope I didn't have the motherboard. Does somebody have like a towel, paper towel or something? This is a good test of Apple. Okay, yeah, cause, uh, can you hand me those towels? Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, people on video. Drying off my keyboard so the computer doesn't fry. Uh, fortunately, I have Apple Care. <laughs> okay. I hope I got most of it. All right. This is why the IT people are like, don't bring drinks into the computer lab. It's your own risk. All right. So back to this. Oh, great. I forgot to hand out the attendance sheet, which is now covered in liquid. So apologize. All right. Can, I, can you start it over there? Sorry about that. I should have known today was going to be a strange day when I walked into the building and I saw Patrick saying hello to everybody. It's weird. All right, so back to interest expense. Now that the computer keyboard is hopefully dry. Uh, H11 equals G11. Interest income. We're going to leave that alone. H12 equals G12. It's not going to affect the valuation anyways, but people like window dressing to see these numbers done. FX gains and losses, zero. I don't know what's going to happen in exchange rates, neither do you. So it's kind of hard to figure out the FX gains and losses, so we're not. And by the way, most companies hedge, and again, it's not really going to affect the valuation. <clears throat> if there are any assumptions that you actually think you do know, 
and you want to overwrite, you're always welcome to. Okay, but I'm going to give you the 90-10 of what really matters, and these don't matter. Okay, next, <clears throat> income and loss from affiliates equal the previous year. So H14 equals G14. Whatever gains and losses they had, they're going to keep, keep having. And then finally, non-operating gains and losses equals ratios H12 times income H3, negative 535.3. Okay. So our next item we're solving for is pre-tax income. You can kind of see the pluses and minuses all the way in column A. Okay. So to get to pre-tax income, we're going to take our operating income minus the interest expense, plus the interest income, minus the FX, minus the loss of affiliates, minus the non-operating gains and losses. Or, if you want to be lazy, okay, I put that formula in G16. Okay, so copy G16 and paste in H16. Okay, so that just kind of takes everything on the left and just subtracts and adds correctly. Income tax expense. If we made $75.6 billion of pre-tax income, equals ratios, tax rate in 2025, H10 times income H16. So we paid 9073.2 in income tax. So next, if we take our pre-tax income minus the taxes, so equals pre-tax 816 minus tax 817, we get income before extraordinary item 66539.8. Okay. Next, extraordinary items, zero. By definition, an extraordinary item should be one time and non-recurring. Okay? So if it happened in the past, it should repeat itself. And it's hard to figure out one time extraordinary items in the future. So again, zero. Now, if we knew that NVIDIA was going to do a major layoff next year, maybe we could put in a one time item for just that one year. We generally don't forecast them into the future. Okay? So zero. So net income before minority interest equals the income before the extraordinary item, H18 minus H19. Minority interest dividends. Okay? If a company is paying dividends to minority shareholders from your original conversion assignment, we're going to leave those alone. They're going to keep paying them. Now, NVIDIA doesn't have any, but another company might. So therefore, for H21 equals G21. And for net income, I'm going to be lazy. Is it equals H20 minus H21. There is my net income. That's what we need to do the TII. Okay? But we're going to actually try and figure out a change in retained earnings, so we're going to deal with the dividends for the cash flow state. NVIDIA doesn't have any preferred stock, therefore no preferred dividends, but again, another company might. So for H23, if a company has preferred dividends, they're going to keep paying them, equals G23. Other adjustments to equity. Those usually occur when FASB changes gap. I don't know what the FASB gap changes are going to be in the future. And oh, by the way, even when they change them, they don't affect cash flow at all. So not going to really affect our valuation. So for our purposes, zero. Net income to common shareholders, take, H uh, take G25, copy it, Go to H25, paste it. Okay. So again, 66539.8 of net income to common shareholders. Okay. So again, I'm just put the formula in there, net income minus those two items. Finally, common dividends equals the previous year. We're not changing dividend policy. Again, we're leaving the cap structure alone. So if they're paying dividends, they're going to keep paying dividends. So again, if I take net income to common shareholders, subtract the dividends, change the retained earnings, take G27, copy it, 
go to H27, paste it. Now there's a reason why I'm actually having you copy and paste this. If you highlight H27, what you'll see is the formula that you copied over is H25 plus H26. Right? If you look over to the left, the formula should be net income minus the dividends. Okay? However, this is a data source issue. Bloomberg gives dividends as a negative number, and we're tying this to Bloomberg. So if I take Bloomberg's negative number and subtract it, double negative, it's adding it. That's, I'm going to get the wrong answer. So because I know it's coming from Bloomberg as a negative number, it's net income plus the negative dividend paid, basically H25 plus H26, is my change in retained earnings. That's another reason why I'm telling you that the model we're building is tied to Bloomberg. Another data source may give you dividends in a positive format. Bloomberg doesn't. And so therefore, it's going to screw up your model. So this is a model specifically tied to Bloomberg and the data feed that I know we're getting from Bloomberg, which will never change. Okay. By the way, the same is true for preferred dividends. I know preferred dividends come from Bloomberg as a negative number. Okay. Ironically, cost of goods sold, SG&A, interest expense, all come as positive numbers in Bloomberg. Okay. But for whatever reason, dividends are negative. So that's why I had you copy and paste net income to common shareholders because that formula is H22 plus the negative H23 minus the H24. Right. Questions about that? All right, so good news. Now that we've finished the 25 income statement, we can take column H, select the whole column, copy it, go to column M, as in Mary, and then paste. We now have six years of forecasted income statements going to 2023, or 2030. Ever get to this point? Make these numbers. So you should have revenue of 8086246. Now, I don't really think in the real world they're going to get to 8 trillion in revenue. <laughs> okay. So again, that growth rate's a little high. We'll put in something more realistic later, but at least so we have the same model, we should have these ridiculous numbers. Okay. Now for the fun part, you would appreciate this in a previous homework assignment. If I go to the TII tab. I take column G, I select it, I copy it, I go to select over to column M, and I paste, and I now have oh, go. take column G, copy. column M, paste, and I now have uh, six years of forecasting and balancing TII. And because this is a forecast, starting in H1, change this to forecast, copy H1. So in about 20 minutes, we have taken the income statements that we have forecasted from the ratios, and we have created forecasted TIIs for NVIDIA for the next six years. And you might say, gee, why six years? That's arbitrary, okay? Because what ends up happening when you do evaluation, you gotta forecast the future. What we're gonna do arbitrarily, remember this on your final exam, that's arbitrary is I've chosen six years because the first five years are year by year forecast. Year six is the beginning of the perpetuity or continuing value period, okay? At some point we go into perpetuity. So the better practice is you always forecast an N plus one year. Whatever that N plus one year is, that's the perpetuity period. So we're doing five years plus one, year six, perpetuity. That's arbitrary. We could have done 10 years of forecast and year 11's perpetuity. We could have done seven years of forecast, year eight's perpetuity. I'm just, for simplicity, choosing five. I don't think it's the right answer for NVIDIA, 
but we're going to make some compromises just to make sure we can do this more quickly. Okay. Questions about where we are so far? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so continuing on, now we're going to do the balance sheet. Starting with the balance sheet ratios. Every one of these balance sheet ratios is a percentage of sales. Okay. Here we're diverging from the book a little bit just because of, again, simplicity. There's two reasons to do this. One, it makes it easier. Everything's a percentage of sales, and it matches the trees, which add everything up. And a second reason, which I'll tell you about later. Okay. But again, we're going to forecast these 11 balance sheet ratios, all as a percentage of revenue. As a placeholder, starting with H14 equals G14, so equal the previous year, we're going to make it yellow. That we can change it. We're going to copy H14. We're going to select all the way down to M23. We're going to paste. So basically, we just have all those balance sheet ratios repeating itself going into the future. And again, we'll put in some more realistic ratios. So the reason why we didn't co copy over the last row, which is row 24, is the last row is invested capital to sales. Okay? And that row is this part of the ROIC tree. Okay? So those historical numbers match the ROIC tree. Okay? It's the productivity. Right? And so the whole point is, as we build the balance sheet, we're going to forecast an invested capital sales ratio. And the whole idea is it's a sanity check okay, to make sure that we have the right size balance sheet with the company. Okay, so if they're spending about 35 cents per dollar of invested capital sales, like this shouldn't go to 10 cents per dollar. Okay, it means we're not, they're not investing enough. So it's just a way of kind of checking the balance sheet ratios to make sure we have an appropriate level of investment. So for now, we're going to take G24, that formula, we're going to copy it and we're going to go to M24, we're going to paste it. Now it's going to be zero right now. And the reason it's going to be zero right now <laughs> is because we don't have a balance sheet. But as we build the balance sheet, these ratios will get uh, sorted out. All right, so now let's go build the balance sheet from these ratios. This is a process <laughs> similar to what we did in the income statement. Again, to make it easier to see, I'm going to take columns B, through E, and on my model, I'm going to hide them. And that way, I can make this a little bigger and easier to see. Oh. A little easier to see. OK. So starting in H1 in the balance sheet tab, that's our forecast. Starting in H2, our first year is G2 plus 1. <clears throat> and the first ratio that we're going to forecast will give us our accounts and notes receivable. So starting in cell H6 <coughs> equals, from the ratios tab, in 2025, accounts and notes receivable as a percentage of sales so H14 times, from the income tab, 2025 revenue, or sales, which is H3, enter 22,583.194. Okay? So if we get that percentage of sales on that revenue forecast, that would be what our accounts receivable would have to be. Now, just for formatting, I'm going to start with H4. I'm going to select all the way down to H33. And I'm going to f 
format this to comma one decimal place just to be consistent with the rest of the formatting. Okay, so 22, 583.2. The next balance sheet ratio is unbilled revenue. Now, NVIDIA doesn't have any unbilled revenue, but another company might. Okay, so just to have it as a, a working placeholder, equals for unbilled revenue for 2025, ratios H15 times income. 2025 revenue, H3, enter. So it's going to be zero, but again, it might be not be zero for another company. Next, we're going to do the same thing for inventory. Equals ratios H16, which is inventory as a percentage of sales, times income, 2025 sales or revenue is H3. Inventory of 11,929.6. Okay. Next, other current assets is the next ratio we're forecasting. So again, equals, you're going to notice a pattern here. Equals, ratios, 817, other current assets is a percentage of sales, times income, H3, 2025 revenue. That gets us to 69,56.3. Next, long-term investments. Again, NVIDIA doesn't have any, but another company might. So equals ratios H18 times income H3. Next <clears throat> will be our net fixed assets, or net pp &E. equals ratios H 19 times income H3. Goodwill, we're going to skip. And the next ratio is other long term assets equals ratios H20 times income H3. So, again, what we're continuing to do is we take the Ratio is a percentage of sales times the 2025 sales, multiply them together, and that's the dollar value that we're getting. Okay. A few more to go. Next one is accounts payable equals ratios H21 times income H3. Other short-term liabilities is the next one equals ratios H22 times income H3 and the final one is our other long-term liabilities equals ratios H23, <coughs> which is long term <coughs> liabilities as a percentage of sales times income 25 sales revenue, which is H3, gets us 57.39. Now, <coughs> those are the 11 kind of core ratios that are primarily part of operating invested capital that we're going to forecast. But we still have to forecast the rest of the balance sheet. So what I'm going to show you is how to forecast the rest of the balance sheet, get it to balance, and more importantly, not have a uh, circular reference. Right? You, any Excel model you ever see with a circular reference is invalid, and in this class, won't be graded. Okay? So therefore, I'm going to show you how to finish the balance sheet auto forecasting without a circular reference. Right? So to do that, we're going to finish up the liabilities and equity first. Okay, so we'll start out with the equity. So starting with row H28, row 28, preferred equity, in 2025 equal the previous year. Since we're leaving the cap structure alone, we're not changing the debt, we're not changing the equity. Okay, so therefore we're not going to issue or pay back any preferred stock. Now, if it doesn't have any, but another company might. 
Same thing with the minority stakes. If you got a minority stake, you're going to keep it. Right? You're not going to do new ones. You're not going to get rid of the stakes. So if you have minority interest equals H29 equals G29. Share capital and APIC is additional paid in capital. We're not going to issue new common stock. We're not going to repurchase common stock. So again, whatever share capital you have, you keep. H30 equals G30. The final number is called retained earnings. We have to solve for that. Okay. So here's how you solve for retained earnings. We start with, in H31, last year's retained earnings. So equals G31 plus, from the income tab, for 2025, H27, which is the change in retained earnings. So G31 plus income H27, and enter, retained earnings should grow to 95,988.8. Okay? Because we know from accounting that net income minus dividends is change in retained earnings. That's how much retained earnings should go up. Right? So that's the point. <clears throat> we can solve for the change in retained earnings. <clears throat> Last year's retained earnings plus change in retained earnings this year is next year's retained earnings. That's how we're putting that number. Okay. So now we finish the four equity accounts. We go back to our balance sheet and we can just add them up. So sum the four equity accounts. Sum the preferred, minority interest, the share capital, and the retained earnings. So H28 through H31. Total equity 109, 122.8. Okay. Now we're going to finish the liabilities. Starting with short-term borrowings or short-term debt equal the previous year. Because we're leaving the cap structure alone, we're not changing the debt outstanding. So whatever debt they have, they keep. Now that we've put the debt in, we can sum the current liabilities. So the current liabilities are the sum of the three above. It's the sum of the accounts payable, short-term borrowings, and the other short-term liabilities. So H19 to H21. Same thing with long-term debt, long-term borrowings. Since we're not changing the cap structure, equals whatever debt they have outstanding. So H23 equals G23. Same thing with pension liabilities. If a company owes a pension liability, it's going to continue to owe it. Okay? We're not going to pay it down any further. Now, companies are not allowed to grow their pension liabilities. They have to be NPV zero going forward. All right, but they still have historical ones. Now, NVIDIA doesn't, but some older companies might. So as a placeholder, equals the previous year. So G25, H25 equals G25. So our long-term liabilities, we can now sum up in H26 is basically the long-term borrowings, H23, H24, the other long-term liabilities, all the way down to the pension, so H23 to H25, 15317000000 million of long-term liabilities. If we add the current liabilities to the long-term liabilities, so H22 plus H26, we get the total liabilities, 37,467.4. And then finally, for H33, if we take the total liabilities, H27, and we add the equity, H32, we get total liabilities and equity, 146,590.3. The next part is also important. We must have a balancing balance sheet. If we don't have a balancing balance sheet, we won't have a balancing TFI, we won't have a balancing CFI. So I'm going to show you the trick to balance the balance sheet. Okay? So for total assets, which is H16 equals H33, we're going to force the balance sheet to balance. Okay? So we now have a balancing balance sheet. Okay? Ha, ha, ha. But what it actually means is all of the assets have to add up to that number. Now, to make sure all the assets add up to 146, uh, 590.3, one of those items is going to have to be what we call plug, which means we're going to solve for something to make sure all of the assets add up to that total assets. 
the plug is going to be excess cash. Okay, so we're going to forecast everything else, and we're going to solve for excess cash such that the balance sheet balances. Okay, so there's a couple items we got to fill in to solve for excess cash. The first one is we need a forecast for operating cash. That is H4. Okay, so how do we forecast operating cash? Equals on the assumptions tab B3. That's operating cash as a percentage of revenue, two percent times from the income tab 2025 revenue which is h3 gives us operating cash to 2751.9 okay and you say gee why did he use operating cash from the assumptions tab why isn't this on the ratios tab goes back to assumptions are universal right companies don't usually change their minimum operating requirements year by year okay so if you need 2%, you're always going to need 2% as a minimum amount of operating cash. That's why it's on the assumptions tab. Okay? But here's the problem. When we copy and paste this, B3 becomes C3, D3, E3, F3. There's nothing there. So what we have to do in our formula, going back to the balance sheet, is we have to tell edit cell H4 Excel that B3 is an absolute reference. So in front of the B, put a dollar sign, and in front of the three, put a dollar sign. And that says that when we copy and paste the formula, it will always refer to cell B3. It won't change the relative reference. Okay. The final item that we have to forecast is goodwill. I don't know if or how much NVIDIA is going to buy somebody for or what they might pay, too hard to forecast, so we're not. Right? Now, I also know that goodwill is generally impaired, which means it could technically stay there forever. And even if you impair it, it really doesn't affect cash flow. So what we're going to do for goodwill is we're just going to leave it alone. Okay? So whatever goodwill they have, they keep. So H13 equals G13. So the only non-total item left is excess cash and we're ready to solve for excess cash okay so here's how we plug so for h5 equals total assets which is h16 minus everything else so minus h4 operating cash minus h6 accounts receivable minus h7 unbilled revenue minus H8, inventory, minus H9, other current assets, minus H11, long-term investments, minus net fixed assets, which is H12, minus goodwill, which is H13, and minus other long-term assets, which is H14. When you hit enter, 61049.6, and most importantly, no circular reference okay and now we're ready to just put in our window dressing we can sum our total current assets so if we take everything above from h4 to h9 and sum that that is our current assets would be 105.270.6. I can sum the long-term assets, which is the long-term investments, net fixed assets, goodwill, long-term assets. So basically H11 all the way through H14. Total long-term assets, 41.319.6. Okay. By the way, just as a quick check, if I take my current assets, H10, and I add my long-term assets, 146,590.3. It exactly equals the liabilities and equity, adding up all of those. All right. now, I don't need that there, so I'm going to delete it, but I just wanted to prove to you we have a balancing balance sheet. Questions? All right, home stretch. Take column H, select it, copy it, go to column M, Select, paste, you now have 
six years worth of forecasted balancing balance sheets. Now we go to our TFI, relative references. Take column G of TFI, select it, copy it, go to column M, paste. You now have six years of forecast and balancing TFIs for NVIDIA, assuming all those ratios come true. And oh, by the way, starting in H1, this is now a forecast. Then I'm going to go to my CFI. You would have really appreciated this in the homework assignment. Take column G, copy it, go to column M, paste it. You now have six years of forecasting and balancing CFIs for NVIDIA. Okay. Again, starting with H1, this is now a forecast. M1. And finally, we go to our economic profits. Take column G, copy it, go to column M, paste it. We now have six years of forecasted and balancing economic profits. Again, starting with H1, this is now a forecast. When you get to this point, make sure you save. And if you got to this point, you've completed homework eight. All right? And if you haven't, you have until Friday to do it. Okay? But here's the idea. This is what's gonna be what's gonna matter. What the TAs are gonna check is did you get the correct CFI? So the last CFI in M, column M, row 37, should be 621.2. That's the number you have to exactly match, right? And in your economic profit, the last economic profit in 2030 should be 3,644,587,800 million. That's a crazy big number but that's the one you got to match. So those are the two most important numbers to match. If you've gotten to this point, you match those two numbers, you're done. You could just literally submit it right now, this file, that's your homework aid. Okay? As I said, if you, you're not there, I'm happy to pull up anything before we leave. Does everybody want to look at anything? You guys good? Get any of these numbers? This has been recorded, including the whole spilling the drink all over my keyboard. It's getting harder and harder. It's getting stickier and stickier to type on, by the way. But it hasn't died yet. I'll give it credit for that. But uh, this is where you need to be. Okay? This is two points. Right? But more important, I'm not giving out the solution right, that I'm building. All right? So you got to build this yourself. And this is where we're going to pick up the Wednesday after spring break. We'll pick up right here. And we're going to keep building. We'll build out the rest of the DCF. We'll build out a bull, a bear, a target share price. So we can do buy, sell, hold opinions. And we'll put in more realistic assumptions to get more realistic values for NVIDIA and talk about risk. So a lot more that's coming. But in order to get there, we're going to build a base. And this is part of the base that we're building. So we'll pick up from this file. We'll keep building it. A couple more classes. Submit along the way. We'll kind of match everything together. Then you're going to take this file that you've fully built and you'll start using it to value other companies. And as I said, I'm not going to hand out a solution. So it's very important that you build this yourself and you kind of get everything to match. Right? So, any questions about this file? All right, so just as a reminder, <clears throat> uh, apologize for getting a wet attendance sheet, but did you sign the wet attendance sheet before you leave? It's up there, okay? And also, no class on Wednesday, okay? So, enjoy your spring break, but Wednesday, 5 p.m., Bloomberg Trading Challenge ends. And between now and before leaving for spring break, I'd work with your teams on the uh, presentations that you're going to be doing the Monday when you come back from spring break, which now include the Intel data. It's in the assignment, and I put the data up there for both Intel, CFI, ROIC tree, as well as the uh, 
NVIDIA, because you're going to do both the analysis and the compare and contrast. 10 minutes per team. Okay? Other than that, have a safe and enjoyable spring break. Don't do anything too stupid. Enjoy yourselves. And I'll see everybody two weeks from today. Have a great day. Have a great week.